let's just listen to, to what he says, first of all, about Luke chapter 2 and the story of the census. So we began the last podcast with the decree from Caesar Augustus, Joseph going from Nazareth to Bethlehem with his wife Mary, who is pregnant, and they can't get room at the inn, and they uh, go to presumably a cattle shed or something like that, and Jesus is born and lies in the manger where he's later inspected by assorted shepherds, wise men, and so on. And you don't believe this happened? So there are all kinds of problems with it, one of which uh, anyone who listened to the previous episode will immediately have picked up on, which is that Jesus was not a Roman subject. And so his father living in Nazareth did not have to pay taxes. The other problem is, is that um, Joseph is having to travel to Bethlehem because that's where King David was born. He's descended from King David. The idea that the Romans would care about the line of descent from someone who'd lived you know, centuries and centuries before is insane. Yeah, I mean, surely everybody would have to be on the move, <laughs> saying, yes. "Where was my, where was my ancestor born? I must Absolutely. go to that place immediately." A a absolutely. So, so that doesn't make sense at all. Um, and so you have to say, "Well, what you know, where has this story come from?" And the basic thing is, is that biblical prophecy says that Bethlehem is where the Messiah will be born, and so therefore Jesus has to be got to Bethlehem. And right. as, essentially, it seems as basic as that. There are further problems with the whole, you know, with. Because our understanding of the Christmas narrative, it's a it's a, a pooling of the two gospel accounts of, of Luke and Matthew, but they don't correspond. So when is Jesus being born? We're told in one account that the wise men come to Herod's court. Uh, Herod is anxious that a king of the Jews has been born in Bethlehem and so launches the massacre of the innocents. Um, yeah. But Herod dies in 4 BC. We're also told that this census is being organized by Quirinius, the governor of Syria, but Quirinius is doing this in AD eight, so it's oh. absolutely impossible. Twelve years to apart. square that, yeah, to square yeah. them. So he he goes pretty hard, there, Peter. He he says it's insane mm. to think that yeah. um, people would reorder their lives, or that the Romans would care yeah. where Joseph's you know great 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 grandfather once lived. Uh, yeah. What would you say to that? Well, I would say um, you've got to be careful to make sure you're seeing what the text is really saying. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think. Uh, the text in Luke says that the Romans cared about Jesus' ancestry um, a thousand years before. But when you do a, a census, I mean, the, the, the purpose of the, for the Romans of having an empire is to squeeze, uh, you know, juice out of everyone. I mean, they, 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 they're in it, um, you know, for, for the power and the wealth. And so you've got to make sure your subjects pay up. Um, and so that means you do a sort of, um, doomsday book approach and you want to register and see how much people have. Now, if I, when, when the assessors come, I can simply scarper off to the next village. That doesn't work at all. Uh, so it's really important that everyone says, these are the families that live here um, and so on. Um, and so if someone has land, so, so for instance, if, if um, Joseph possesses land uh, um, in uh, Bethlehem, he would have to go back. Um, and we do have um, a, an actual source, uh, which I can share with you, mm -hmm. um, about um, uh, people having uh, to go back to uh, their hometowns. Um, it's it's a, a text from the year 104. Uh, ignore the scribble on the left, which should have a Greek font. Uh, mm -hmm. But here we've got it's uh, a text from Egypt. Census by household having begun. It's essential that all those who are away from their gnomes, those are... Uh, uh, not not things you have in your garden, uh, uh, sections of Egypt, be summoned to return to their own hearths so that they be perform the customary business of registration and apply themselves uh, to the cultivation which concerns them. And then he goes on and explains how, you know, we know there are some people who uh, can't do that because they've got work and they can get a certificate to, to get them out of that. Um, so you have a text like that where... Um, Clearly, within the Roman Empire, sometimes people did have to travel in order to go back to be registered um, at the right uh, place. So there are certain conditions under which that happened. But there's a, a further aspect to it, which is Luke writing his gospel or whoever writes Luke's gospel clearly wants to be seen as reliable and is writing at a time when there are his audience are under the Roman Empire. They know what Roman taxation looks like. So if he writes a completely implausible story, uh, wh whatever date in the first century you, you put 
the writing. It just doesn't make any sense. This story has to make sense to people. Oh, yeah, of course you have to do that and go back to your um, your your family home home to be registered. Um, Or and it doesn't even say that, um, you know, everyone in the world had to go back to their uh, their, uh, family home. It it specifically says that uh, that's what. Um, Joseph had to do so. You, all, mm-hmm. all you need to do is have a particular reason why Joseph has to do that. Yes, the um, census, the census is for the Roman world, but it's Joseph who has to get back to his family ancestral home. Is yeah, that, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and you can still have a wider thing. Then he's got another aspect um, which he's concerned about, which he says, "Look, um, the the Romans are in charge of the Roman Empire, but obviously Herod uh, in Judea, Herod the Great." Um, he has got his own kingdom and you can't expect Roman tax guys to go into Herod's kingdom and start doing an assessment. And I think, uh, again, um, that sounds plausible, uh, but it's it's not fully watertight. And so, again, I'm going to share a text with you um, uh, on this. Uh, and this time we're going to look at uh, one of Tom's favourite authors, namely uh, Tastus. Uh, mm. So this is Annals, book six, um, uh, section 41. And it talks about this uh, group, um, just reading the text, if you can see it. At this time, the Clitai, a uh, tribe subject to the Cappadocian Archelaus, that's not any of the Archelaus in the Bible, retreated to the heights of Mount Taurus because they were compelled in the Roman fashion to render an account of their revenue and to submit to tribute. There they defended themselves by means of the nature of the country against the king's unwarlike troops till... And then it tells you about how the proper Romans come along. Now, Mm -hmm. what it's telling you there is this guy, Archelaus, clearly is a king and he's not got very good troops. And they're able to hold out for a bit. And then uh, when uh, the real Roman troops come along, uh, then, uh, you know, they get properly whooped. Um, So, again, that is a clear bit of evidence. It's during the reign of Tiberius where Romans do go into uh, uh, their areas. And I, I think when you look at, empires the thought that the um overarching power just stays wholly out of uh the area of their um, subject doesn't really work and then i've got one more text to share um mm-hmm. which is just about um the relationship between um augustus and herod what we've got here is um herod's just bumping off too many people including his sons um uh, and augustus gets narked with that and so we have um uh antiquities uh, book 16 section 290 and just look at that last line the sum of his epistle and that's the emperor augustus hmm. was this whereas of old he that's herod um sorry H- H- uh, augustus had used him that's herod as friend he would now use him as his subject he'd now treat him as a subject so mm-hmm. um there's a definite souring of the relationship uh between um Herod and the emperor. And so, again, the thought that um, the emperor, who we know Augustus loved measuring things, um, would, wouldn't would send any of his guys in uh, in any way um, doesn't quite make sense. And again, for the, for the uh, text of Luke to be correct, it doesn't even have to have lots of Roman officials wandering around. It can still be um, uh, overseen, uh, b- uh, by uh, Romans, but carried out by by Herod's henchmen and, and so on. So I just think that there are a number of things to explore here. Um, certainly, the, the whole question of um, Luke's census is is a, is a great puzzle. Um, one of the what's, things... the what's the nature of the puzzle? Well, I, I think um, part part of it is where Quirinius fits in. Mm-hmm. Quirinius is is governor from the year AD six. Uh, uh, and Herod the Great is normally thought to die in 4 BC. So you've got a chronological thing. Uh, you've got how how does the census happen? Are there other records of the census and so on? And each of those can be uh, tackled in turn. I think sometimes what happens is something that's highly probable, like Herod died in the year 4 BC, which let's say it's a 90% probable thing, gets treated as 100% uh, <laughs> probable and mm-hmm. i always want to make sure i'm keeping the uncertainties there there are scholarly articles arguing for a different uh, date of uh, herod's death which is 
uh, Josephus says happens before a lunar eclipse, and you've got lunar eclipses in 6, 5, 4, and 1 BC. And, you know, people uh, sometimes play around with that. The 4 BC seems to be the best date, but it's not It's not the only thing. And you've got, typically, with the, when you're piecing t- things together as a, 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 in history, there are a number of these things, and it's not that there's only ever one way that things can be fitted together. And so sometimes people will come along, and you read a sort of Wikipedia article, you read a even a scholarly book, and it can state something as an absolute certainty, and you really dig down and say, that's just a um, highly agreed conclusion. It's not um, a fact. I mean, what was interesting is hearing, I can't remember whether it is Tom or Dom, on on the um, uh, podcast talking about how um, Luke's gospel was almost certainly written towards the end of the first century. And I thought, well, there isn't actually a shred of solid evidence for that. Um, that, uh, Lots of people may agree that, but lots of people agreeing things doesn't make them true. So I just think that, um, you know, it's important for people to take a holistic look and uh, realise the uh, case for the New Testament uh, can be made. Uh, There are even, uh, you know, views that Josephus makes mistakes. Well, he does make mistakes sometimes, uh, Mm -hmm. but may have in this particular situation of what are his sources, what's he trying to show, all sorts of things. Um, there, there are just permutations that you can imagine. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give you an exact date for the year of Jesus' birth, and uh, it's a subject of ongoing interest to me to try and, you know, find out more. I don't think a Christian believer who has a positive view of the um, New Testament needs to settle on one particular model and solution. I don't think it's necessary. Let's uh, turn to the issue with uh, how it harmonizes with Matthew. Um, mm-hmm. how, how do you put together the timeline? So, you know, Luke is all about the angels and the shepherds, and Matthew has got the wise men coming from the east. Now, yeah. how, how do those two events kind of fit together chronologically? Well, I think it's very interesting, again, um, backing up a bit, uh, in this um, a common model... Uh, of of the way people explain the Gospels, uh, you know, um, in in scholarship, Matthew and Luke don't know each other, um, and they they so they they've got these independent uh, reports, and that's interesting because they both have Jesus born in Bethlehem, uh, mm. they both have visitors, they both have a genealogy. Um, I I would say that uh, well, I mean, you can obviously add some things together in that you can have wise men come or magi and you can have uh, shepherds come Um, you could put the bit in Matthew um, a little bit later they don't um, uh, the wise men don't have to rock up on on the the night of um, of the birth Mm. you've got one area where they they sort of subtly agree and that is uh, about um, Joseph in Matthew is looking to uh, divorce his fiance. Then he changes his mind, um, and he um, why does he change his mind? Well, in Matthew's gospel, because an angel's appeared to him. Now, what's interesting is that in the genealogies between Matthew and Luke, um, Joseph has two different fathers. Um, you know, one's called James and one's called Eli. Well, wh- which is it? But you could well imagine that if someone is a um, engaged and they in this traditional society and then their wife uh, their their fiance is pregnant uh and uh you know dad doesn't really uh, approve of this um and uh, then when he says i'm going to go go through and, and marry her because an angels appeared to me he says you know you're not my son anymore uh, so that sort of thing uh, can happen there's a little bit on just the timing of when um, Mary goes off almost straight away after hearing from the angel in Luke's gospel for three months and with with her pregnant relative Elizabeth. She then comes back. So again, you've got um, that period when um, she's away and then she's going to come back and show us pregnant. So you, you could fit those things together. Um, but uh, I, I suppose there's one other difference that you've got, and that is that Matthew has... Joseph and Mary and Jesus going down to Egypt. Luke doesn't have anything about that. Uh, They just shoot off back to Nazareth. Well, you know, again, it depends if you allow pricey, if you allow for the fact that sometimes people can legitimately summarize and miss out some things. And 
and sometimes you shorten a story. So if people want to ask how my wife Catherine and I met, I've got a short version and a long version. And if I mention a particular thing, I'm going to have to do the long version to explain it all. Otherwise, I've got the short version. We just met in Belgium and it was all very simple. Uh, otherwise, it's going to get more complicated. Sometimes it can be like that. Yeah, right. Now, it, it seems to me like you're approaching this this issue with a, a kind of a, a prior assumption that the Gospels are largely trustworthy, mm -hmm. such that... Um, initial difficulties that you don't know the answers to you're you're just happy to to hold that at arm's length and and, and be agnostic about some of the details yeah so if, if someone is a a fan of the rest is history podcast and they're they're sort of they followed the tom holland arguments that on the macro details the gospels kind of fit the ancient world but they're just not sure about whether any of this Christmas stuff happened. Like, what, what would you say to give somebody confidence that Matthew and Luke, let's deal with them, Matthew and Luke are worth trusting? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly uh, give advice that I'm sure um, uh, Tom himself would give, uh, which is to read the Gospels. They're only about nine hours mm -hmm. long to read all four of them. Uh, so that, that's a good starting point. And I think um, in them, you will see plenty of signs of reliability. Um, so I think you can have individual things within a a system which don't have a lot of probability um, in themselves but when you look at the evidence as a whole you see there's more reason to believe them and I think that's what we've got um, you've got to look at the, the package of Christianity as a whole how much it explains the person of Jesus all, all these sort of things together and I think that gives you a lot of uh, reason to think yeah this holds together and then we've got some problems and um, the question of the census in Quirinius, uh, with, under Quirinius um, in Luke chapter 2, is I would say, and a lot of people would agree, the toughest historical problem in the New Testament. Okay, so okay. That, that's, mm. that's as tough as it, as it gets. It doesn't get any tougher. But it's, it's not that it can't possibly be solved at all. So I'd almost want to use that as a sort of outer barrier and say everything else has, has got uh, more going for it. Um, you could have contradictions of the level that said Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea and he was born in um, Alexandria in Egypt. And, you know, no, you, you can't put those two together. Um, right. So that's where we just don't have that level of difficulty in, in the texts. Um, the, 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 um, the difficulties you have are more like the sort of puzzles you'll get on Christmas Day as some of your presents. Uh, they're things yeah. that, you know, uh, might keep your mind uh, ticking during, uh, you know, the King's speech or whatever.